Uh, welcome friends to this uh, final day of our program, the post Bandara meeting today. Uh, it's very nice to review what happened uh, during the last few days and to see if we made any progress. Did we take full advantage of uh, the time we spent here? Are we going to hold on to the experiences we had here and use them when we go back or are we going to leave them all here? Sometimes we have a tendency to hear something and say it was very nice and then we leave it there and our life goes on as usual and we go back. But the advantage of an event like this is that whatever we learn here, whatever experiences we get here, we take them with us and continue to make more progress till we can come back and report more progress. Of course, sometimes hurdles come in the way, karmic hurdles come in the way, and we find that we cannot make the same kind of progress and same kind of experiences when we are not here. Some people say, why can't we have a continuous bandara all year long? <laughs> then we are sure to make some good progress. So there is a difference in what we do here. You have come specifically, carefree, out for a particular purpose. When you go back to your own home and to your own work, then the attention gets all divided back again. And therefore, it becomes more difficult to make the same kind of experience happen which happened here. But one can do one's best and make some, some small progress, internally or externally or both, so that by the time you come again, you can feel, now I have to add on to what I had earlier. That always helps us. So this is a good uh, time to review that we got something here and let's carry it with us and not leave it behind. People like to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting where they can ask a personal question. And I appreciate it because sometimes our progress on the spiritual path is held up just by a small thing which could be answered by a quick question and answer. And it is not such a thing that you ask in the whole crowd. It's too personal for that. As yet, you find there's nobody to answer, so you start thinking about it and your mind causes confusion and that causes more impediment and you can't move forward at all. So that is why sometimes even one minute of question and answer, three minutes, definitely plenty. In three minutes you can ask those specific questions which are coming in the way of your spiritual growth. And of course, uh, there are some questions which uh, I don't know how to answer. One uh, lady asked me, I want you to tell me how you can find a, find a husband for me who should be very smart, very good looking, is completely in love with me, does not look at any other woman. How do you help that? Uh, what, uh, what answer will you give to a question like that? I, I'll say, ma'am, go to the causal plane, look at your Akashic records and see if such a person exists. Then. I'll help you to find him. <laughs> sometimes the questions are, uh, sometimes so much of our wishes and desires to fulfill. Another saying in English language is, if wishes were horses, beggars would ride on them. That means there's a difference between wish, difference between ambition, desire, all these different words have slightly different meanings. Wish, when you wish for something, it's less anticipated to be fulfilled than when you desire. And when you have an ambition, it's likely to be more fulfilled. When you have a seeking, it's the most likely to be fulfilled. So these are all different words representing different levels of how we want things for ourselves. So uh, people ask me questions about their wishes and I can't be very tactful. I have not been a very tactful person, I think. Sometimes they give blunt answers, then they don't like them. Uh, when I came to this country first time, I had no means to travel. From India, there was a restriction on how much foreign currency you can carry. They, the first time I would travel to this country, the maximum was six dollars. 
and I had to depend on my friends to support me. And in turn, when they came to India, they stayed with me, and that's that's how we were able to travel at that time. Uh, one day, the government in India reduced that amount from six dollars to four dollars. I came by a plane, uh, um, Swiss Air, and stopped in Zurich and found some nice little thing, and I spent those four dollars there. When I landed here, there was no place to go to a taxi, no place to. I had no money at all. So I called a friend who lived far away. I said, "Can you do something?" She said, "Go to the board where the list of hotels is written, and sometimes the hotels have their own cars to pick you up." I said, "Oh!" I went back and looked. There was a list of hotels. The limousine, their cars will give a pickup from the airport free to the hotel. So I called one of the hotels. Said, "There's nearby airport hotel," and their car came and picked me up, and I went to check in. They said, "Show us your credit card." I said, "What is that?" <laughs> <laughs> I have never heard of credit card. I've heard of other cards. I know greeting cards. I know. <laughs> <laughs> They said, "No, don't you have a credit card? We can't check you in, or give the cash." I said, "Cash is with my friend." Now, sorry, we can't check you in. Go sit in the lobby. We won't throw you out. You come from far off. So I said, "Can I make a phone call? A collect call?" Which I had learned about collect calls. Fortunately, <laughs> I called that friend of mine in the middle of the night. Had to go to a West Western office and uh, wire the money to that hotel. And early morning, I was able to get it. So then I realized I should get a credit card somehow. I should get something. A Canadian friend of mine gave uh, an additional card in my name. Then I was able to travel better. So. I had. Sometimes you have no idea that you can get into situations where you have to uh, have these problems come up. So in the beginning, I felt it is a very difficult country to go to, where there are so many demands. So rules are so strong here. But now I feel so comfortable. And when people come, I say, "Come on, from India, no problem." Of course, they have relaxed all those rules from, since then. There are many other things that came up as hindrances, but gradually I found that there is some power that solves all problems, and it is experience that makes you feel that yes, problems can be solved, and we can go through this. Here, are some friends of mine have come from what they call down under. I don't know if they know about it, because we call them down under. They're living in down under, so they live in Australia. So they have come from Australia. They have never seen winter like this. They have never seen snow like this. And uh, last night I saw some of them not wearing the kind of dress we wear for this kind of weather. So they are getting accustomed to it. Next time they say we will be very fully prepared. The point I am making is that when we have experiences like these and we go away, we learn lessons from those experiences. We learn lessons from obstacles as much as we learn from. the solutions to those obstacles it's not merely that we learn from good things even the obstacles and impediments that come in the way give a lesson and we avoid those we come to know ourselves what are the things standing in our way and then we overcome them i know some people are, some people coming from some areas like snow they like to ski they like to go make Little balls, snowballs, and hit each other. <laughs> It's supposed to be a game to hit each other. I sometimes wonder how this, these kind of games started, like boxing and so on. They hit each other, and you feel good. <laughs> There must be some other law operating to make these things good. I had promised uh, that uh, on this day, uh, I am not giving a discourse. I have given plenty. I am not going to. Talk of the methods of meditation. I've done plenty this time. I'll tell you some stories only. So I am going to now tell you stories of one of my very dear friends, one of the best sadhangis of great master that I ever met. A simple man, a simple man from an Indian village. Not a village; it was a little township. A simple man who. by his hard work 
getting a scholarship and help, was able to get a degree in veterinary science, in animal treatments, in animal science. He was able to treat cats, dogs, horses, camels, elephants. He could treat any kind of animal with his knowledge. He was hired by, he was employed by the prince of one of the states called Kapoorthala in Punjab, India. At that time, it was a separate state. He was hired by the prince, the ruling prince, the, like a king of that little small kingdom. And that place was only about 20 miles away from the Dera which Great Master had set up. This uh, doctor, whose name was Dr. Ishar Singh, this Dr. Ishar Singh, the veterinary doctor, he was very much in search of some true masters. And every master, every holy person that would come in town, he would go meet him, attend his discourses, and was not satisfied. He felt that they were falling short of what he was expecting. He tried their methods, he tried different kinds of yoga, different kinds of practices, meditation practices, but they did not work. Finally, some neighbors of his were Muslims, and he was a Sikh. They were two different religions. The Sikhs were um, following a Gurudwara <coughs> with the a holy book Guru Granth Sahib as their Guru. The Muslims were following the Quran, a different scripture in Arabic, and they were reading that book and saying that's the truth. So there was no real inter interaction. But three of the Muslims in his neighborhood were disciples of the great master. And he happened to come across them because of some animal of theirs falling sick. Once he found them, they said, there is a great master. He lives on the river Bias, on the bank of the river, about three miles down from the main road, the Grand Trunk Road, they used to call it because it connected the east to the west of India. They're just about three miles down from that main road. And if he goes along the bank, he'll find a small hut. It just consists of two or two rooms, actually. And the great master comes on weekends because he's employed in a job far away in the hills. He's an engineer, civil engineer, and he's a roads engineer. He works on the roads far away. He comes on weekends. If you take a chance, you can go on weekend, and he has a, a weekly satsang. And on, he comes on a Saturday, gives a discourse on Saturday evening, and then gives a discourse on Sunday morning, and then he goes back to his work. He's a working man. This doctor said, I'll go and explore. I want to see this man, who they call a perfect master. So he went along the river bank, and he took his bike. He used to go on his bicycle. He took his bike and is going along the river bank, on a very tiny little road, and three miles past, four miles past, six miles past, there is no huts, and there is no data of any, any master at all. So he says there must be something wrong. He goes a few miles further, about eight miles. Then there is a ferry bridge, uh, that is a boat bridge that is uh, disassembled at night and put up together, boats are put together. But a boatman is there to take emergent people, emergency people to the other side. He asked that boatman, I was told there is a dera here, there is a master who comes weekends, and he's on this side, on the river bank. And the man said, oh, my friend, you are making a mistake. He's on the other side of the river. You're walking on the wrong bank. You go back and come tomorrow on the other side. That's only three miles away. It's not so far. You've come too far. He says, I don't want to go back. I want to meet the master. I understand he's perfect master. He says, you know, all masters claim to be perfect masters. So I suggest you go back. No, I want to go now. Can't you take me by boat? He said, the boat will only take you to a small village there. To go from that village up north into that dera, there are no roads. And it's a thick jungle, it's, it's all brush and all its uh, bushes there. There's no road at all, how will you go? He said, no, I'll walk through the bushes. I know how to walk through jungles. I go with the animals into the jungle. I'm a veterinary doctor. He said, look, you're doing at your own course. They're also wild animals. They can attack you. 
He said, no, no, they love me, all the animals love me. <laughs> so reluctantly, that boatman takes him across the boat and he takes his bicycle. He, there's no place to take the bicycle on the floor. He carries it on his head. He takes his bike on his head and he's walking along the bank, sometimes losing sight, then trying to go near the river. And eventually it took him so long, early morning at about 4.30 or quarter to five, he reaches and finds the couple of rooms. And he finds this must be the Dera. So he knocks on the door and a woman with an angry face comes out. And she says, how dare you come at this time? Have you no sense that you come to disturb the master at this time? And she uses some bad words also. <laughs> she, I will not repeat. He is so shocked because he knows that woman comes with the master. He knows her name. He knows that this woman was a disciple of great master's master's master. He knows she came, she was in Agra. She came with he, Baba Jamal Singh. Now she is still, old woman is still with this master. And she spent her life with three masters. And look at her anger. If she got nothing, what am I going to get from this master? And very disappointed, he goes back. He says, this woman is so mad and angry. So he goes back. In the morning, he gets up ready, meets those neighbors of his. He says, you are wrong. There is no master there. If the master was real, a, a person would be at peace. A person would lose anger. That's the first thing I would like to see, a person at peace. And he should be calm. This woman was so angry, used such language, she could never be with a master. Therefore, there was no master. They laughed at him. They said, he said, why are you laughing? I'm just telling you, reporting what happened. They said, master played a trick on you. What kind of game is this? The master, I went seeking for a master and the master plays a trick. He said, yes, master plays a trick that you went to see the master. You never saw him. You saw a woman and came back. That was the test. When you go to see a master, you see the master, nobody else. If you have gone to see other people, that is not satsang, that's not seeking a master. Master just proved to you one fundamental principle that when you want to find the truth from a master, go for the master. Shut your eyes and ears to anybody else. Don't judge a master from what anybody else is doing. He just tested you. My dear friend, you failed. If you go next time, you will find the same woman, the most peaceful woman, and the one who has never raised a voice. It's a master's game that she did this to you. I can't believe masters can play such games, but I'll test it again. I'll go and see if the master is real or not. So this time he went in the daytime. He knew where to go. So he went in the daytime and it was evening time and the master had finished his discourse. So he was sitting on a chair and this doctor goes and says, Master, I came to see you, but a woman turned me away. The woman said, I apologize. It was only for that day. It was only meant for that day. Something like this. He said, Master, I've been looking for everything. Those disciples of yours have convinced me that you are the Master and you give initiation. You give Naam and that is the real secret by which we can work on it and go back home. Master said, are you ready? I am ready. I've been seeking all my life. I am ready. He says, have you broken your right arm? Is that a requirement? Is that a requirement for initiation that you break your right arm? He says, no, it's not a requirement. It just happens that your right time for initiation is after you break your arm. And you get it healed, then you get initiated. But master, why should I break my arm? He said, you know, don't you ride horses? I've been riding horses all my life. Sometimes one can fall from a horse, you know, and get an accident and you can have a fracture. These things happen. I have been a horse rider. Master said, I broke my leg. And what, what is there if you break your arm? So when you break your arm, heal, then you come back, I'll initiate you. Guaranteed. Break your arm, heal your arm, come back to me, you'll be initiated. 
He said, this is the most odd kind of experience I'm having <laughs> with any master, any yogi, any swami that I've met. Goes back, goes back, his wife's name was Maya. He said, where have you been? She said, I, I went to see a Maharajji, a, a master. No, the prince, Ma who they, we also call him Maharaj. The king is called the Maharaj there. So the Maharaj has been calling you all day. He has sent so many messages. I can't tell him where you are. Run quickly to the palace. And the Maharaj is waiting for you there. The king is waiting for you there. So he ran there. Some animal must be very sick that the king has called him. And the king was sitting on his throne. And he said, Isha Singh, where have you been all day? I've been waiting for you all day and sent so many messages to you. He said, I went to see Maharaji. Well, is there another Maharaji? I am the Maharaji, the king said. He said, no, he was a master. He is a spiritual master. I went to see him. He says, I waited all day. You know what happened? This morning, I got two new horses, real Arabian steeds, straight from Arabia. They came. And I, people said, inaugurate them, write them. I said, no, till my doctor comes, till my uh, veterinary doctor comes, he will ride with me. That will be the inauguration. He said, Master, I'm not going to ride the horse. <laughs> <laughs> what has happened to you today? You've been riding with me every day? You have been riding horses? Master, I don't want to break my arm. He says, what's happened to you? Who has put the superstition into you? What kind of guru did you go and see? He put you into the wrong track and put new superstitions in you? You ride every day? This never happens. Come on, ride on it. Please forgive me. I just heard that I'm going to break my arm by falling from a horse. He said, look, I'll tell you. For my sake, for my face saving, I've been telling the whole courtiers, everybody, that when Nisha Singh comes, we'll go together. They'll take pictures that we have inaugurated the two horses which have just come. You just sit on the horse. Put your foot in the stirrup. Sit. I will sit along with you. We'll take a picture. Then I'll ride. You can get down. Go back home. So he said, that's all right. So Nisha Singh puts his foot in the stirrup and just jumps on the saddle, the horse shoots off. <laughs> it's a new horse, doesn't know there's some little stone there, and the horse trips and falls. There's a multiple fracture. And Nisha sings on the same night. He said, Master was real. <laughs> what about, he said, what a way to find out a master by breaking your arm. Never heard of that before. That I thought these are all karma. I thought these things happen by karma. I didn't know that master causes these things to give us initiation. Anyway, he tried to heal. There was a multiple fracture. There was calcification. And later on, he couldn't move the whole arm properly. It would go like this. It couldn't move more. There was something that struck elbow, shoulder. He went back to the master. Master, you were right. I broke my arm. Initiate me. He says, OK. Now you raise your right hand to your ear. He says, Master, is that a requirement also? <laughs> you never told me about that. He said, I told you that you break, when you break your arm by falling from a horse, then you heal it and then come to me for initiation. It's not healed. He says, Master, it can't be healed. It's a calcification for life. I have to live like this. He said, when your horses break their legs, do you kill them or you heal them? He says, sometimes we heal them. How do you heal them? When the calcification takes place, we put a very strong acid and mix with little turpentine oil and some certain acids and they can dissolve that. But it's so painful. The horse to whom we give that treatment, he hits on the ground, hits on the ground, makes a hole on the ground. It's so painful. But he, we do cure some horses like that. So why don't you try the treatment? <laughs> no master, no more. <laughs> That's so painful. I'll die. He said, no, 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 you won't die. I'll tell you the way. You use turpentine oil, dilute that acid four times. And then use it. And then your calcification will go. And then you come back. I'll initiate you. So he then tries the treatment. And then he's, he is able to put his arm back on his ear. And he then he goes back. And Master says, now you are ready. 
You were not ready day one when you came to ask me. He said, I had no idea that my arm had anything to do with it. But anyway, he got initiated. When he made, had made so much sacrifice to get something, he valued it more than many other people did. So he really worked on it and got such beautiful experiences. And the love, uncondition of the love, captured his heart. He said, I've never experienced this kind of love in my life from anybody. So because of that, he became one of the dearest satsangis of great master. Then he said, I have come into this life. My mother has passed away. My father is my nearest relative who gave birth to me. The best thing I can do for him is to get him also initiated. That will be the best thing I can do. So he went and told his father, Bapu, God and his father Bapu, Dad, I want you to come and get the same good thing that I got, which has made, changed my life, made me so happy. It is initiation, Nam Dan by a perfect living master who lives in the, on the bank of the river in his dera. Dad said, don't you ever talk to me about that. We are Sikhs. We believe only in the Holy Granth. We believe only in the Holy Book. The Gurus have said that after them, the ten Gurus, there will be no more Guru and the book will be the Guru forever. Don't teach me anything. There can be no living Guru. There can be no Guru in embodiment. You know. But Dad, all those ten Gurus were human beings in bodies. And each worshipped each other. Not one of them had a master who was a book. When those ten masters themselves had all living human beings, why don't you believe there can be human being? No, because after the ten gurus it said that now the book will be the guru. I have to go by that statement. Don't ever bring up the subject before me. And don't talk of that master again. I hate him because he's trying to pretend to be a master where he's a human being, ordinary human being. He said, come on, see him once. I will be happy if you just come and see him and come away. He said, I will never see him. I'll never go near him. He said, there must be some, something about uh, uh, this uh, man that I can't uh, explain. So he went back to the master. He said, master, I want my dad to be initiated. Is it possible? He said, yes, it is possible. One day he will get initiated. He says, but do you know he's a tough nut to crack? It's not easy. It is not very easy. Every time I talk to him, he doesn't want to see you even. He says, when the time comes, a person who is totally a non-believer becomes a believer. It's a certain time, certain events happen. It's karmic. And the, he's going through another phase. When his time is right, he will come. I tell you, Isha Singh, you bring him to me, that's your job. Initiation is my job. So he said, that's a great assurance. All I have to do now is to bring him. So he told his dad, I, I want to take you there and you just wait one minute and come back. I'll be happy. You Don't you want your son to be happy just by making not there. Anywhere else you tell me, I'll go. He said, I, somehow I have to take my dad to see the great master. So one day, the great master was going to travel by train and go somewhere. The railroad station is about three miles away from the Dera. He said it has no connection with the Dera. Everybody come to railroad station. So he told his dad, I have some work with the station master there, station superintendent, and uh, I had some problem with his uh, animal. Would you like to come along with me just for a ride? He said, okay. So the dad got his horse, and he says he got his horse, horse and they both went in time for the great master to be already there on the platform waiting for the train. So when he went there, he said, Dad, can you hold my horse? I'll just go meet the station superintendent and come back. So the dad said, all right. He held his horse. He was on his own horse. He said, OK, come quickly. So he went down and said, Master. Master was standing on the platform with other satsangis. The train was still to come. Master, still 10 minutes for the train. I have brought my dad upstairs. There's a little slope to go up there. And can you come and give him a darshan? I, that's all I want. And he says, and Master says, he says, let's run. And they both ran. 
can't you imagine a master running like this with this <laughs> rent? And they both ran quickly. And they ran to the top. The dad had gone. <laughs> leaving, he's just seeing horse right there. He suspected there was something wrong. The dad suspected this is a game being played. He said, sorry, Isha Singh, you did try, it didn't work. But my promise still holds good. You can bring him to me, I'll initiate him. He says, Master, you don't know what you are challenging. <laughs> don't accept the challenge you are accepting. He can even sense that you are here and run away. How will I ever take you to him? He says, well, that's your job. <laughs> I've done, I'll do my job, you do yours. And then Isha Singh comes back home. He says, there is no other way to take my dad. So early morning, he finds a rope. That's a big rope. <laughs> you know, we sleep on those little charpais. They're little beds made of uh, very light beds. And when the dad was sleeping, he just put the rolled the rope around and tied him up. <laughs> and he had hired a horse cart, a tonga, a horse cart already early morning to take him to the dera. And that horse cart was waiting outside. He tied, he was a strong man. Uh, dealing with animals, he had to be strong. The strong man tied up, picked up the, dog, uh, the dad along with the bed, <laughs> and took it out and put it and tied it up with the horse cart. And dad cried, what are you, have you gone mad? Is this the way to treat your father? He was crying. He cried so loud, all the neighbors came out. <laughs> and neighbors said, they used to respect Isha Singh. Isha Singh, what is this going on? He said, my father has gone mad. I'm taking him to the hospital. <laughs> He said, I am not mad, he's mad. <laughs> Terrible scene there. He told her, run now, run. <laughs> Take as fast as you can. And there the father tied up on a bed, tied up on a horse cart, approaches the dera. <laughs> this master sitting outside watching this scene. <laughs> and there he brings and the great master gets up. He's sitting on a chair, he gets up. He says, Isha Singh, what is this? He said, I brought my father. <laughs> <laughs> you told me my job is to bring my father, your job is to initiate him. Let's see how you can do it. <laughs> he says, you are such a bad son to treat your father like that. Open the ropes. Look, you have injured his hands and legs by tying him up like that. Is that how you treat your father? The father said, that's what I've been telling him. <laughs> take him off, take him inside, put some balm where he is. Great master ordered his sangis. Take him in and put some, give him treatment, bandage him. This is, the, this is the way the son treats his father? They took him in. And Isha Singh is waiting. He says, what is going to happen now? There is no chance of his getting initiated. <laughs> so then great master comes out and puts his finger like this. He says, Isha Singh, now you go. Come back after three days. He said, three days? Even three months is not enough. <laughs> anyway, he goes away. After three days, he comes. And three days later, when he is riding on his horse, he sees a strange scene. Great master sitting on his chair and his father standing in front of him like this. He said, that couldn't be my father. <laughs> it is his father. And when they approach there, he sees it is his father. His horse happens to dirty the place. He shit right there. And his father takes off his shirt and goes and cleans up. My son, you are always a mad, crazy fellow. Don't you realize before the Satguru, you're creating dirt here? He says, Bapu, is that you? <laughs> Dad, is that you speaking? He says, you never explained to me who he is. You never told me who he is. You never told me he teaches the same thing in a living form, which I was reading in the book. You never explained to me. Do you know how lucky I am? Only this morning he initiated me and gave me now. He should say he was shocked. I am telling you this story not to be followed here. <laughs> Don't try it here. <laughs> it worked on this good old days. It can't even be tried today. <laughs> Such is the remarkable, a remarkable way. Isha Singh had three sons and he wanted 
they to get them initiated one of the sons went for a, a swim he went for a swim in the river and never got back they found out that the area where he went to swim was full of manatee crocodiles and they were very sad that he lost he says what kind of master he didn't save him his own relatives came up he says saying relatives you are following a master who can't even save your son that means uh, it's not real after all he should be able to do that much for you that to save your son who died he says no i know master says it's all the destiny and it was written destined to be like this and he they said where is the body you don't even know that you couldn't even do the last rites which we think is very important if it was a destiny and we do last rites we'll be happy that he gone back in the hands of the lord of the hands of the father and therefore you couldn't even do that then he asked the master master I, the, my relatives are all criticizing me they say leave this master because he could not save your son he can't even find the body days have passed master i know if you can if he is found his body is found in 3 days you can bring him back to life 3 days is getting over fourth day is coming so nothing happened master said whatever is the will has to prevail he should think accept this destiny it was written beforehand his life was only this much then he goes out eight days have passed and his relative says pull out from there it's no use it can't find the body even then master is going on a car one day on the bridge and uh, he's just saying he's standing there master i can't put up with all the um, all these uh, kind of things they are saying to me all my relatives they are messing up my life by constantly taunting me taunting my wife and my wife has now got into their mood they are taunting me too life at home is totally gone out of uh, out of harmony and also i don't know how to live now master said it's so important for you okay see you didn't see that bend of the river he pointed out from the bridge that part that sometimes holds up things so he goes there after so many days the body is found so they bring back and he is satisfied at least the body is found and his relatives began to keep quiet that the master did point out where the body was but then his wife was not happy at all she said i lost my son i lost my son he took his wife to the great master and he said she is crying she says she is missing her boy and master said look he has been taken care of look because of his thing his soul has been taken care of no i want him back do you really want him back yes when did the, when did you have a last child about 9 years ago okay he'll come back he same soul will come back to you and she still kept on crying he is okay you have another child okay so um they, they went away not sure she got pregnant she gave birth to a child and they when they looked at the child they said the same child has really come back new body so after when the child was still growing up uh is just saying went to great master he said master we think is sure the same child has come back he said same so let's come back because the wife kept on crying and saying this this is not the best thing i do the better thing was they shouldn't cry but she cried so for just for the compassion that i had for her right brought the child back but listen is just saying i told her he will come back she still started crying she kept on crying and so i said you have another child so i didn't know when i said i will have another child she have one more that will not be your son and he will not live long but don't worry about first one will live so he used to believe by now he was believing <laughs> the word of the great master so second child was born who died shortly after that but they didn't my my mind that first one grew up and i saw him i saw him went he said i only want to work with the water works i only want to work in the ocean i want to he was trying to work nowhere except the water which drowned him in his past life i i said well, 
we'll check with get master if it's all safe for you to this time or are you come to repeat something <laughs> so he did work in water works and is doing very well as an engineer water works engineer things like these not all not all great things even things that it would depress us sometimes happen in life life is full of so many so many things that we cannot uh, understand how destiny operates masters normally do not want to change the destiny they intervene if it is hindering our spiritual growth they will intervene but if we are constantly asking for things that are only affecting our destiny events over this life then we are just putting our attention totally somewhere else and that doesn't work well for our spiritual growth therefore the general rule is we should accept our destiny if it is unbearable yes go ask for divine intervention if you change all these events into other events then you are really taking a detour you're taking a detour on your spiritual journey and it's best to stick to what's happening some some of these uh, events that happen in life are such that we feel this is the time when we needed our master most what happened to him because our judgment of what is good for us and what is bad for us is not based upon an accurate understanding of how these things are made to go through the destiny pre ordained through which we have come into this body and which is necessary for us to hold on to this body and to make progress while we are here these events should be accepted if you go inside you will always accept your destiny as it happened with julian johnson who accepted his destiny only after he saw from inside how important it was to have a destiny with ups and downs destiny with good things and bad things destiny with pleasant things and unpleasant things we all have that kind of destiny otherwise we wouldn't be human beings if we have a painful experience it may last for a while but then it goes away if you have a pleasure experience happiness experience it goes away and something happens to interrupt that it's the normal course of life normal course of human life not necessarily any other kind of life and since we need uh, our human life to make progress on the spiritual path we should not so long as it's bearable put it up cheerfully we are paying we are settling accounts nobody else brought this karma into our life we brought it it's our own history you do something tomorrow you regret and say why did i do it it was your action you don't blame anybody else then at that time just because you can't remember what happened in a life is cut off from this that you think this is the only life you did it you did good things you did bad things that's how the combinations started here so one should accept this is what is available to me this is how i've come here and i have to put up of course if it is too bad unbearable surely go and may, and master will make it bearable he will not make it so bad that you can't even meditate he won't make it so bad that you can't remember the master he'll make it certain that the spiritual journey is not interrupted by his divine intervention but divine intervention is possible ask for it it's really needed otherwise cheerfully go through your karma i told you the stories i would have told more stories but the thing is that we have a limited time and i wanted to end up with a session of meditation with you because i always feel that to talk and go on forever and practice is sometimes much less than that let's make practice a little more so after having learned that the true form of meditation is to locate yourself behind the eyes to start don't start till you are sure of that put yourself behind the eyes that you are sure the body is merely a shell around you you are sitting up here behind the eyes then you start your simran your repetition of words when you are repeating the words if the sound starts coming in interrupt the words and put your attention on the sound the sound weakens start the words again the words cannot take you too far the words take you only up to limited time the rest will be all by the sound 
So when you get a sound, practice listening to the sound and practice catching a sound that resembles the bell sound. When the bell sound comes, leave everything else and put all your attention on listening to it, it will pull you in. So if you get different pictures in front of you, replace them with the picture of your master. By replacing the picture of the master, other images will disappear. To get the picture of the master, do not make up a picture of the master. Remember an event, an actual meeting, how you saw the master, bring that back. Bring the memory of that picture back, not just make up a picture with the mind. So that works as dhyan. So use Simran, Bhajan and Dhyan, all three, and have an attitude of love and devotion for the master while you are doing this and your meditation will be successful. Let's close our eyes and start. Before I conclude, I want to mention one fact which came to my notice because a lot of emails came to me this morning from people who attended the Bandara. And many of them cried a lot yesterday. Some cried while they were having interviews. Some cried while they were meditating. Some cried at night, some cried after initiations, and one remember cried so loud that you could hear him while he was getting prashad. Why do people cry? Why are they crying? And what is happening when they cry? Some people, very first time they see me, they cry. And you have many people sitting here who have had that experience. So the reason is, that this is a cry coming from the soul. It's not a cry coming from a thought in the mind. It's not a cry coming from something that has disturbed you in the mind. It's a seeking the heart. And the soul, or what we call heart or soul, is crying for something, has been waiting for, and sometimes the cry is of rejoicing. And sometimes the cry is for cleansing. Sometimes the cry is for getting rid of something that has bothered us so much without our knowing. The cry can be rid of the fact how the mind affected us. There are so many factors responsible. It's a cry, part of the seeking. Otherwise, so many people, some people have never cried before they cry. Uh, this, and this and they don't know. Some are very happy after crying. Some say we don't know why we cry. So, I'm only referring to this crying. It does so many things. One person uh, wrote to me this morning that after crying he was in some other world and he's now living in another world and this looks too shallow for him. Just after crying, somebody wrote to me that uh, uh, the crying uh, seemed to have wiped out something somewhere which I couldn't see. Things like that. We collect so many cobwebs in our life. We collect so much stuff on our mind and embed it there. So very often this experience of a different kind of experience and uh, especially after initiation it happens very often that uh, so many cobwebs that were collected and we didn't know they were cobwebs. These are just memories, just, just things that happen and they are interfering and we, they are wiped out. It's a cleansing operation. So the earlier it happens the better it is for us, really speaking. But sometimes even even missing the master can make you feel like crying. I will end up one more story before I start interviews. One more story since lunch is now not at 12 but 1 o'clock about the same guy, Ishar Singh. He is such a beautiful guy, such a beautiful friend. When, when he was old, he used to tell me, uh, he said, Puri Sahib, he used to call me Puri Sahib by my last name. I have now, I am turning old, I have drawn more pension than I drew salary. I could, if he were alive, I would tell him, he should sing, I have drawn three times the amount of pension than I drew my salary in my whole life. So, we are matching each other, trying to one-up manship with him. Such a great friend of mine. When Isha Singh was so happy and satisfied, he wanted the great master to visit his town and say, come to my town, come to my house. There is Sangat, there are people, disciples waiting to see you. And I'll organize a, in my house a small gathering of people. 
He was living in a one-room hutment, and there was a little courtyard where the buffaloes and cows were tied up. And they're a dirty place there. So Great Master said, I will come. I will come and uh, you arrange a car, somebody has a car to drive me there because my car is not working at this time. So there were two rich people, rich disciples of Great Master. One was a <coughs> professor in the same town where Isha Singh lived in Kapurthala. And there was, uh, uh, there was a judge, Dariai Lal, who later on became the doorman of Great Master. He was a judge and a finance minister of the state, of same state where he went and, uh, to treat the horses of the prince. So those two people had very good cars. So he requested them and they said, yes, we will send our cars to bring Great Master. It's a great honor. So one of the cars went on the day appointed. He said, was working hard, Sevadars, come, clean up the place. Tie the cow somewhere else, tie the buffaloes elsewhere, all this shit, wash it off. And clean the place, this satsang will be held here. Master will come and sit here, place a, put a place for him and clean up the place. So they were cleaning up the place thoroughly for master to come. And the master came and people were waiting on the lane that went into Isha Singh's house, just outside the lane they were waiting. And master's car came and drove by and went right through. Never stopped there. The person, the people sitting in the car were the professor and the judge. They took them to their own homes. They had beautiful bedrooms, beautiful guest rooms set up for the master with all facilities. And they said, Master, we have made arrangements for you. They stopped at the house of the professor. And they said, Master, we have a room for you and everything. Shall we take your bags out? He said, no, no, leave the bags in the car for the time being. So he got down. All the relatives and family members of the professor bowed at his feet. It's customary to do that. And then master said, you know, I think I'll stay somewhere else. They said, okay, he's thinking of the judge who has an even bigger house. So they got back in the car and drove to the, to the uh, judge's house. And there they got out and all the family members greeted him. And they said, master, can we take our bags out now and put them in your new bedroom we have made up. He says, no, look, that poor man is waiting for me. He says, say, I think I told him I'll stay with him. Master, he has no place. He's only one room and there's no bathroom. And how does he use the bathroom? He goes into the fields outside for number one and number two, <laughs> both. <laughs> and how does he take a bath? Master, he... He has a little bucket of water. He takes on the top and pours water on him. That's all he does. There's no arrangement there. I can also do that. It's only a matter of a couple of days. Master, that's very uncomfortable. Can't do it. While this is happening with the master and the car, people are telling, Isha say, you've always been a fool. You thought he'd come and stay here. You made us do all this seva and clean up the place. Master's gone to stay where he would stay. Where we all expected he would stay. He's going to have a satsang there and let's run at least. So they all ran <laughs> to go to the place where the master was supposed to be. And everybody, and this just said, go away, go away, I don't care. Master said, he'll come here. His wife, Maya, said, you've always been a fool, my husband. I am also going. <laughs> she also left. He just said, went to the room, locked it from inside and cried. Master, what kind of game is this? You promise that you'll come to my house. Just because they're rich people with better arrangements, you go there. What is the value of love then? I thought you loved me more than their big buildings and so on. He was crying like this inside, with tears, crying for the master. The master's car comes back. He tells the driver and the guard and others, stay, stay with the car. Don't bring it in the lane. I'll walk alone. And he walks alone. And he knocks at the door. He says he thinks it's another satsangi trying to call him to go to satsang. Go away, he says, go away. <laughs> then Master says, he says, saying, this is Savan Singh outside. And he opens the door. And Master comes in. And he says, crying even more. While the Master hugs him. And says, what did you think? I will not come here. Then I made a promise I'll come here. 
I'll not only come here, I'll stay here. Satsang will be held outside your house. He stayed with Isha Singh, Satsang was held outside his house. That is, that crying where I can think of it brings tears into my eyes. That kind of longing and love that that man was having and faith, Master, you said you're coming here. The, everybody, including the rich people, came to attend satsang there and sat outside where the cows were just moving and all that, you know, outside. And first visit of great master outside the Dera. That was the first visit. Of course, when Isha Singh became so friendly with me, master gave him a pair of shoes of his and he locked them up. And they were the most valuable possession that he ever had. He said, I've got master's shoes. Master died. He had his shoes. He said, they remind me of master every day. I put them high in the cupboard next to master's picture. They are so important for me. I had come to America by then, and I was at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And there was a friend of mine in Connecticut, Roy Cole. And he was a great satsangi disciple, and he wanted to go to India with me. Master had died, but we still want to see the Dera. So he traveled with me and went to Dera. We saw the things. He stayed with me in Chandigarh, where I was posted. <laughs> then I said, I want to show you a man, a remnant of the good old days of Master, and his name is Isha Singh. He's retired, but we'll go to his house. So I took Roy Call to his house, and Isha Singh saw him, and he said to, to Isha Singh, my friend, Ishwar has told me that you have a pair of shoes, a great master. Can I see them? He said, where have you come from, America, all the way to see shoes? He said, they are great master's shoes. I'd like to see them. Isha Singh opened his cupboard, said, here they are. Roy Call goes, puts his head on those shoes. Isha Singh cries. He's crying to see Roy Call put his head on those shoes. He comes out crying. He says, I can't imagine an American guy coming with you, respecting my master's shoes like this. What can I give him for showing so much affection? When Isha Singh retired, he was given a robe, with gilded robe. The thread was all gold. A gold gilded robe that the, that the Maharaja himself used. And as an honor to Isha Singh, he gave him as a retirement gift. Isha Singh went and took out that robe. He said, I present it to you for honoring my shoes. Honoring great master's shoes, this robe. And Roy called, put on the shoes. I look like a king. I look like a prince. I took pictures of him. <laughs> he was very happy. He took that robe back. The story of Isha Singh again. That wonderful person. It shows what love and affection, unconditional love of a master can do to you. There is no limit to it. It is infinite, limitless. The effect love of master, unconditional love happens on you, changes everything, changes your perspective, changes whether you have seen anything inside or not. What is happening outside is sufficient enough to tell you something is going on. It never happened before, it never happened with anybody. And when it happens with us, we know who we are with. And that is why these stories affected me and were great inspiration for me. I hope you have great experiences. You'll have safe journeys back. And I hope to see you again next year. Blessings.